you keep searching for something on Google, you're going to continually be fed what you've been searching for. It's going to feed your own bias. Hello, I'm Dr. Amit Shetty. Welcome to the Future Health Podcast. This is the podcast about the way we work, the work we do, and how technology will influence the future of work in New South Wales Health and the healthcare industry as a whole. Our guest today is Bianca Jordan, Chief Information Officer at Helios. Bianca has worked at the state and federal health jurisdictions and is now the CIO at a private health pathology consortium. Bianca is passionate about patient-centered care and technology and I'm looking forward to digging deeper into the future of work with her. What is the future of work all about? Well, we are about to find out more. With me now, I've got Bianca Jordan, the CIO of uh, Helios. Bianca, I'll let you, let you introduce yourself. Okay. Thanks for having me on the show. From the accent, you can tell I'm not Australian. I'm from South Africa. And the reason I actually moved here was back in 2000 was the first time Australia was starting to look at health records, and especially in Northern Territory. And I thought this was an exciting place and opportunity. And um, while I'm at Helios now looking after pathology technology, I've been with eHealth New South Wales for many years. And prior to that was with the Australian Digital Health Agency with the My Health Record. So long exposure to technology in healthcare and just seeing the transitions and the things that are happening. It's incredible, the opportunities. And especially, I think, the leap that we're seeing the change happening now with COVID we are being forced to adopt technology and use it in different ways that we might have been hesitant to previously. Um, so, yeah, an exciting space. Yeah, now taking on that point around um, the changes, the key changes that have happened in the last few months, for that, for instance, um, would you like to dig in a bit more around what are those traditional boundaries that are broken down and how do you see the future of health evolving from this and how do you see work, worker and workplace changing? Yep, I think it, in a couple of areas... I mean, telehealth has been around for a long time. I remember um, seeing some doctors present on what Alaska was doing with the, you know, with how big the country is. And over here, there's always been that hesitation and do we do it, don't we do it? COVID, it's now there. Many doctors adapted and there's people that like it, there are people that don't, but at least we're learning now. We're trying it and we're learning and we're working out what doesn't work. Um, the whole environment around people working from home. Being a mother, I would often work from home, but there's a, there was often a perception, are you really working from home or are you loafing and watching TV for the day? Whereas now we've been forced into it and there's this acceptance that actually people can be just as productive working from home. Um, yes, there are the mental health issues to be worried about, um, but we've opened our horizons and we're now going to have to work out, well, what does this new normal look like? And if you often think of banking technology, if you had said to somebody that was used to going to a bank teller and watching someone face to face transacting with your money, to then going to an ATM in the wall and pushing buttons and this machine gives you money, to lying in your bed any time of the day or night, moving money around the world, people would never have grasped that change. And we've almost done that change in a much shorter period because we've been forced to. So we do adapt. Often these kinds of changes take long, a long time, but COVID has sped some of these changes up where people have had to lower their barriers and go, okay, I'm going to try it. And actually some things worked and some things failed. And we've also learning to accept failure a bit more. Actually, this didn't work, but let's learn from it and move forward. Yeah, it's almost like crisis, having a crisis to learn quickly and move forward. Um, in that same sense, though, uh, how have you seen pathology evolve or private pathology service evolve in the last few months or years? And where do you see this going? Yep. I think, um, and I think it would be the same for any organization. It's that focus. Okay, what's important right now as a private business, um, making sure you're still getting revenue in, but making sure you're managing your costs, prioritizing, prioritizing COVID, how you move the workforce around. Um, we had to stand up some technology to enable working from home really quickly. Um, anybody working in technology knows 
just any bad situation, other people come and abuse it. Security is one area where there is just so much abuse going on. So just getting the basics of security right. We've always been good with patient information, but all the other French security environments, there've been a few companies who've collapsed now because of what's happened with security, not because of COVID, but because of security breaches. So, you know, we're adapting with security, working from home, the pathology, COVID testing, new instruments coming out and learning to adapt to lab quite quickly, moving things around, being able to test patient self-collects. Where, where can we enable a patient to do that? Um, and then how do we support a digital workflow um, when you've still got older technology, but you do want patients to be able to move around, support telehealth consults. So just adapting and trying to make things faster. Um, for us, it's a challenge with some of our older technology, but mixing it in with newer technology. Yeah. And how do you see the future playing out? Do you think this is temporary change? Oh, definitely not a temporary change. Um, I think the pendulum swung one way. A lot of people working from home, um, a lot of fear of going out. Things will swing back, but never to where it was. Um, I surveyed my team the other day to try and figure out, well, when we are allowed to go back, obviously in Victoria, they're working from home, but other states, who wants to come back? How do you want to come back? And just surveying people's opinions of the work environment. Um, that's changed. There's some people that have the opportunity to work from home, others don't. The, the technical teams who work in the labs have to be there to plug in the instruments, work with the computer. So you've got a mixed workforce now. Um, and we'll have a hybrid situation. And can even people who should work from work in a site, can they work from home some days to do the admin stuff? Um, so, you know, people in their um, attitude towards work and productivity at home, I think, has changed. In the healthcare space, patients do expect more. Um, I think most patients, if you ask them, and I know when I've left the hospital with my husband and he gets the discharge and the piece of paper, he goes, what do I do with this? It's like, well, you need to give it to the next person because it won't necessarily flow. But he's like, but it was in a computer. People just expect everything to be connected. I think because of COVID, we are a bit more connected, but patients are expecting the same experience that they have from ordering pizza. And I think um, if I look at the pathology space, where do we go in the future? Most people picture the pathology in the lab where the actual testing happens. But there are two other really important components, the doctor and patient getting the result afterwards and the patient actually going for the test and the doctor ordering it. And those are also areas where change will happen. Um, I saw a presentation by one of the fridge manufacturers, I can't remember which one, but they said they're busy working on a fridge that would do a lot of the vital stats in the morning when a person leans up against the fridge. You go to the fridge to get your breakfast, so why not build vital stats into a fridge? And can you do some minor pathology testing on your by your fridge? So, you know, where, where does a and patient... And tell you what breakfast to eat. Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly. Glucose levels way up. and Exactly. So how does... You know, yes, we're all wearing wearables, but where else will we build devices into just our daily life and collecting information about our health, which you would do in this day and age in a, at a collection centre, in a hospital where people are getting the specimens. We might do more of that outside of that. Um, also, while we've got a lot of technology, doctors still like writing on paper. There is still a lot that want to do the paper, but AI can be used to read that to get it into a computer where we're still in paper. So I think um, America, the electronic orders in the pathology setting is still only at about 90%. They'll never get 100%. So can technology help get the remaining paper bits into the computer? It's interesting you raise that point because on one end, there is the other piece of technology and people asking for things and um, I've always believed that business models drive change so just like this crisis yeah. the need and demand will probably outstrip the provision of you know whilst the system then catches up with it yeah. Um, but yeah there is a big space of having that commingled workforce as well um, how do you see in that situation um, if you me, if you can, uh, the life for the worker in healthcare for the future? I think the life of the healthcare worker will change. Um, 
computers don't have empathy. Yes, I know there's a lot of building and things going on, but there's something about the human touch. And there's something about, uh, this COVID has also proven that. As much as you interact with another screen on a Zoom or a Skype, a Google meeting, people still miss that interaction. And I reflect on myself, I've really enjoyed working at home. I'm far more productive, but the days that I go in, I do have this high and I am actually am on fire in ways I didn't expect. Um, so we need that human interaction. I think it's about how we support people with that and understanding, Get uh, help people get rid of the fear. I, you know, I, I think of a day where I'm not doing emails, not doing admin tasks, because there is a computer doing those things and I'm doing the things that only I can do. And how do we build, how do we differentiate what computers are good at, but what people are good at? So it, it'll be a combined world. Pathology, like radiology, there will be a lot more algorithms doing that initial diagnosis, but you can't have a computer telling a patient they've got cancer. Um, there's just, there's, there's that role that the human will always play and free us up to do the things that we're good at that a computer will never do. It's how do you, you know, work together in a complementary society. And that could have significant impact on the way we educate our workforce as well because those are the kind of skills we don't very much focus on during our academic progress through a course for yeah. sake. So, yeah, that, that I can see it can have significant impact on how we train our workforce as well yep and train i mean if you i mean i mean from your side over the time the different technologies you would have seen as a doctor you've you've been really happy to, happy to adapt to these and change so helping all of us learn to continuously learn be open to the change and not getting entrenched in certain ways but then i think also resilience and emotional intelligence so being resilient to keep going through this change the pace of change is there having been a change manager for many years, I do, you know, people say we've got change fatigue. The change isn't going to go away. It's not about change fatigue anymore. It's about change resilience. It will change. How do I change? How do I object to things in, a, in the right way and how do I build for the future? And then just that emotional intelligence, because at the end of the day, it's dealing with people. Um, although I'm a CIO, I would say 70% of my time is dealing with conflict, and people and helping people adapt and work together. And that will always be there. And that's the thing that computers can't take away. A computer will have an algorithm, people have emotions, yeah. and we have to deal with the people and the emotions that a computer can't deal with. And you raise a very important point there, which is around the technology person interspace and the interaction. Um, and do you see that changing significantly into the future, especially around the fact that I still have to type, let alone write, type is still for me a bit of a thing saying, well, that comes in my way of actually discussing with you. What if I was just typing right now while I was talking to you saying, oh, look, I have to record it. Um, how would that feel and what impact that would have on that empathy part of patient care relations? Um, that's an interesting space as well, don't you think? Yeah, I, I remember... Um I think it was when New South Wales Health was rolling out the electronic medical record and part of the change component that the team was dealing with, with was with nurses and taking notes while speaking to the patient. And um, one of the hospitals, they had this bit with the nurses introducing the patients and saying to them, look, I'm going to be taking notes. I am listening, um, but this is to take notes to help us in, in your care. And having that discussion with the patient rather than trying to ignore it, yeah. rather introduce it, say this is part of the care. I would have previously written it on a piece of paper. I'm now typing it in. I'm not distracted. And just explaining that. And most patients will get it and will understand it. And they go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So instead of rather ignoring it, because it is part of the note taking until the bit that we get to good enough dictation that something can be listening and converting it to notes with the context, there it's, will be that interaction. Be there, yeah. But even those algorithms you're talking about, auto-test ordering and picking the right pathways and things for patients is, is, is significant because that significantly reduces my load of having to type things in. Exactly. Um, and pre-selecting or checking in or checking out things. You raise an interesting point there about how technology will change the way we deliver care mm -hmm. and we do things. Um, how do you think it will ensure the equity of access for 
the patients in the front line. I'm hoping that it will bring an improvement, especially things like telehealth, access to specialists from a, re- a re- remote location, um, access to information. I mean, more people even in remote and rural situations now have access to internet. Not everybody uses it, but there is that access and with time, more people will use it. But I think then that also brings up the risk of patients bringing their own information and their own biases without the education of it. And I think there is a role to help patients understand what's real and what's not and how to understand and look, research that information in this age of misinformation. Um, I know um, Victoria have done this. No, it wasn't Victoria. It was, I was reading some article. Oh, it was in America. Some guy had been interviewed, he had COVID, and he thought COVID was fake, that this was all rubbish. And I'm like, there are 20 million people and all these deaths, and you think someone's lying and there's rubbish in this. So just this whole misinformation and how to interpret it, I don't think um, historically research and information was you know, kept very separate and very academic. It's now more open and accessible to the average patient, the average consumer. But how do you become a educated user of information that you and you don't bring your bias to it? Also, helping people be educated that computers run algorithms. So if you keep searching for something on Google, you're going to continually be fed what you've been searching for. It's going to feed your own bias and helping raise awareness. I think there's an area where government can help raise awareness so that patients are at least aware of their biases being reinforced as opposed to when you picked up a paper encyclopedia, it would cover all the topics and get all the angles. Now you keep being fed your own angle. Um, so I think there's for patients there's that risk. Around the other thing is patients also just understanding and, and for the health systems around more internet of things, more devices, there is the opportunity to hack them. And be it hack them to get the information or hack them to hurt and harm. So we do have to be more aware of that. Um, Not fearful of it, but just more aware of it and put in the right controls around that and make sure that the right investment and focus is done on protection. Yeah, you raised some two key points there. One is yeah, I think the term they're using now is infodemic um, uh, around the explosion of information yes. around the yep. pandemic. But in general, that's not just true for the pandemic because the the amount of information that's coming out of these systems for the last few years yep. has exponentially increased. Um, but I would probably challenge that the view that the the data and the information held in years of research was any different in the quality spectrum. Yep. Because um, I think the balance and checks in places were not necessarily and yep. could have easily been biased towards the teams conducting it. Yes. And especially when there's a conflict of interest in drug trials and other things. So that is a much broader dis- um, thing to address, I think, going into the future of yep. the quality of information and uh, who then does that quality checks for them. The other thing that you interestingly raised there is this whole concept of data as a commodity. Yep. Um, And addressing data as an asset or a finance. Yep. We we do a lot of checks about our bank and financial details moving around. If there's an irregularity in our data, in our $10 coming out, I get a SMS. I, I would see that something like that happen when I share my data, and if someone is going to make some kind of commercial, I do get a return out of it yeah. too. So there is, it is almost like an investment in my own data because yeah. it is my own yeah. asset. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I think that I think that's interesting because there are two angles to patients or consumer data. It's someone else benefiting it from it financially. Or you're providing the information to someone so that they can run the algorithms and add the insights to it and provide it back to you at a fee. And that's where you're willingly doing it. Um, I think just like we donate our organs, we should be donating our health information moving forward. So when when you pass away, you go, right, here's all my health information. Whether I had a healthy life or whether I've passed away from something else, donating that information so that people can use it to build knowledge. Um, my son 
has got the first child my health record. And I just think, yeah, although there's there's some stuff in there, there's not everything in there. But for the first time, people are going to have the true longitudinal health record. We think about a longitudinal health record as bits of health information, but that'll be overlaid with his environmental information, his sports, and a whole lot of things that in 40 years' time, there'll be such a different view of things that impacted him now and what it does in the long term. Um, so I, I'm very much for sharing my information with controls and boundaries. I don't mind. I like the idea of being able to give someone else my information to for a purpose I'm choosing to benefit from, that someone else can run some intelligence on it and give me a different perspective. Um, but I do think we have to think also about who benefits from it and how, how are people compensated in this age of information being the currency? Yeah. I know we're running out of time soon, but one last question. How do you see the bright and the dark side of this impacting workforce and discrimination in terms of being able to use technology? Because it creates a certain new definition of disability, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think... I think it does. So I think for some physical disabilities, it's great because it opens doors and gives opportunity. Um, I think it's a lot around, at the end of the day, we are still people. Um, understanding we're working with people. It's, all about, it's still all about the relationships, working with people with integrity, being honouring people. Um, in that so understanding that some people are going to be at the different end of embracing this and being fearful of it, but also knowing where information and technology can be abusive. And because it's done on algorithms with biases, being aware of that and starting to make sure that legislation and controls are there that, you know, for algorithms, we've documented that algorithm. So if an incorrect decision is made, we go, this is where it was incorrect, we fix it. Just like you would in a physical setting, we made a mistake, let's learn from it. Why did the plane go down? Learn from it. The algorithm said X, it was Y, let's learn from it. So making sure those controls are in place and going back to the human side about choice um, and respecting one another's views and opinions and working, coming towards where we can, a ground of understanding and everybody's going to come at it from a different perspective. There's so much we could discuss further, but thank you so much for coming and sharing your views with us. Um, Bianca Jordan, thanks. Thank you. So that's all we have time for this episode. Thanks for joining me on the show. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to like, share and subscribe on whatever platform you are on right now.